Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. And I'm Emily Crosby of the Southern Oral History Program, the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And I'm conducting this oral history today as part of the Civil Rights History Project, which is an undertaking of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of African American History and Culture and the American Folklife Center of the Library of Congress. Today is June 28th, 23rd. The Museum of African American History and Culture and students from Atkins High School. And um, from left to right, Mr. Charles. Yeah, Charles Jordan, put this on that chart. Mr. Uh, Mr. The one in the water, white Charles. Uh, John Dudley, Mrs. Francis Suggs, I'm looking Harold at Suggs, and that's what my charge. Uh, Charles Mr. Right Doug was class of 1960, um, and everyone else was class of 1950. Uh, no, okay, so what I'd like to do is ask everyone to introduce yourselves. Um, if you could, if we could go around and you could say your name and what year you graduated, and then I'll come back with another question. Thank you. My name is Charles Jarman, and I graduated from Atkins High School, class of 1957. My name is Eleanor Stewart, and I graduated from Atkins High School in 1955. My name is John Belly. I graduated from Atkins High School in 1952. My name is Francis Sutton. I graduated from Atkins High School in 1953. My name is Harold Sutton, and I graduated from Atkins High School in 1953. My name is Samuel Dove. I graduated from Atkins High School in 1960. Thank you very much. I was wondering if we could start by each of going around the room again. And if I could ask each of you to talk. Tim said log in and watch online. I know. Tim just logged in. I won't bother him no more. I guess maybe if you could each speak for a couple of minutes. And then we can just follow up questions yeah. and background and then talk about the rest. Tell him not to get his arms up the line. Charles Drummond and Ruben Kissel, North Carolina. My train. No, tell him it's all good for real. Yes. Tell him to die as the cops. Tell him to die. Uh, and my aunt and uncle. And, uh, I ain't become a million now. on the Library of Congress so, uh, website. I get these people telling their story about what they so went through in, in the civil rights era. And enjoyed, um, my I ain't never seen it. I it's just clicked on it. I really did not go to public schools. I like about black history, so I clicked on it. 
was outside of Kinston. There was a couple of Reverend Mrs. Moses that came by my house every morning and picked me up as a youngster and took me to school and until I was in the fourth grade. Then I became a student in uh, the public schools in Kinston, North Carolina. Was that a private school or a school in another community? It was, a, it was not a private school. It was a school in another community. And I guess you call it a school, as we used to say, out in the country. <laughs> if you know it, because I felt like in Kinston, we've been in the city. <laughs> but um, they, um, you know, they were very gracious in doing that. So I came to um, the public schools um, in Kinston as a fourth grader. And then um, when, um, Samson Elementary School was built. My class was the first school. It is the name of the channel. We was on this thing. And then from there, I went on to act. That was not TV. That was JW Broadcasting Online. It's well, JW Broadcasting dot org. I think. Or you just type JW Broadcasting. Very close. And he was but this right here is the Library of Congress today. Belly stove. There were two or three classes in the same classroom, and he was the principal. I think it went through. I hey, new friend. I, I can't say I your name. Know. That's a lot to say. But they were just good friends. Thanks for joining. How you doing today? They did, <laughs> and I was. What kind of work did you call this? Yes, he. Um, he ran a um, pool room uh, and he ran a uh, club. The, 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 the club channels club. I plan to move it on was JW Broadcast and G Mama. Um, you'll just type in JW Broadcast and that's where I got the movies from yesterday. Hey, Queen of Crazy. Just watching um uh, an educational the video. I was gonna play the slang narratives, but they don't got no pictures. They just got the voices, so I <laughs> thought this saying. would be cool. So uh, that's how that works. Now, y'all want me to click on the slang narratives? I go to that, but it ain't got no film. It just got voices, audio. I'm doing good today. How you doing today? Or deceased, but I did have the uh, pleasure of having them for most of my, all of my 18 years. The mother died in 2010, the father died in 74, and we had they had hey, Malika they had and the kids. kids. How y'all doing to, uh, today? Mitchell Court. My grandmother also lived in the Tulum Court, but she didn't have anybody at her house. I also had an aunt That's there. the queen of crazy. So that kind of made clean room for everybody. Now, I lived with my aunt three years, mainly my high school. Y'all can mingle and talk. I'm just going to let the video play. Y'all stay in so long enough. Other people come in, too, and that way everybody can chit chat. Three meals a day. Breakfast. Lunch and dinner. And that's good when the kid is doing good. No. <laughs> we had that breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now, at 18 years old, uh, my senior year in high school, I would travel to Atlantic City to work. And uh, that would uh, take me to college. I worked every summer. And uh, one or two summers, the elder was there. Why did you touch my phone? Also, I it just that, started. Uh, as a kid, at a grocery store, and I delivered to a grocery store. Hey, Amelie. At the elder's house every Saturday. And some other things came home. And uh, I had a good life. And uh, college, uh, I was able to maintain because I worked through college. And. Uh, now, my father was the, uh, I guess you call it, you call him a mechanic today, but he was a, a handyman at the Jordan Court. My mother worked seasonal work in the tobacco factories. And I do remember the, 
after World War II, that she worked alongside many, many Damn. German prisoners who okay. worked at the factory. Yeah. Well, that was very interesting. I guess about 40, 50. And a little more on. What in the world is you talking about? A protest that's a tyranny against the new world order. Who is you and what are you talking about? This is a video about black history, not a new world order, honey. I don't think nobody gonna join you on that. Watch the video now, or I had to um, block you. Okay. Um, I grew up in a, a family of about five or six. I had a sister and a brother. My brother is older. They are both still living. Um, and a mother and father who were in the family. And a grandmother. Look, just watch the video now. We don't know nothing about that day. Um, Six, six, six is a man on it. It's incomplete. It is written on the hands and the forehead. Everybody that is imperfect hands. You don't even know what it means. Read the Bible and be quiet. Watch the video. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah, they don't know what they talking about. I pay that little attention. I ain't even going to delete them out my life. Just let them talk. That's a beauty. Ain't nobody else there now. Um, Oh, here, right. Back in the right there. Ain't that one my mom's in here? My mom's in here. They be done blocked you. I'm going to let you stay. Watch the video. But anyway, we uh, went to Tower Hill Road and then to Atkin. Um, anyway, we went to Tower Hill Road and then to Atkin. And uh, life was pretty good for us. My father uh, worked at a shirt factory. Uh, I really don't know what he did. What is it now? I just know that he was able to come home for lunch and watch his stories every day. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> he rode a bicycle. And, uh, and of course, he didn't know at that time that that was very good. Hey, Tanya. Uh, and uh, he would come home for lunch every day. And uh, my mother uh, worked uh, several different types of jobs. Uh, she yeah, he is talking that. crazy. I don't know what he's talking about. Just let him stay in here and watch the video. I told him to be quiet, dude. He don't know what he's talking about himself. He, she, he, I don't know who it is. Well, the year that I graduated, 1953, the year I graduated from high school. Um, let's see. I'm trying to remember um, the kind of life that we had. We had a very, very good life. We uh, interacted with the uh, neighbors and uh, in and out of the houses. And we had a lot of fun. I was a musical. And my sister was my dinosaur. I think she, she wouldn't say that. But, uh, he was musical, and my brother was musical, and still sings today at the age of 82. So um, that's pretty much my life. Um, this is about the people that live during the civil rights era. They telling their story. I hope you have some time. <laughs> 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 you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, the, 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 the experiences are very similar because we're coming from the same. I was an adopted child. Y'all know what I should have uh, been. And, uh, but the parents, the people that raised me were very loving, you know, uh, but the situations behind the separation of my brother and myself, you know, were, were I guess, were told to me. So the validity of them, you know, I, I, I have to accept them as they were told to me. I was I was born in the uh, in, the, in the Green County, which is a, an adjoining county to uh, Lenoa County, which is uh, Green County. It's uh, in a place called uh, Snow Hill, North Carolina. Hooker in Green County is is, uh, is, is yeah, still right his story. You got County. that right. I went to school. All my school was done in Noah County from the first grade right on up through uh, graduation. I, I had a I had a very interesting um, 
I guess you could say childhood. I was an only child of an adopted family. They cared very much for me, and I, I, I realized that as years went on. Um, I uh, I met my my father for the first time when I was in fifth grade. My biological father. That's also the time I met my wife, who was sitting right beside me in the fifth grade. And uh, my father bought me a bison. Uh, some of you can remember this. A Shawin bike. You have a spring in the back. And, and from that day forward, you know, I became an entrepreneur, so to speak. <laughs> Seriously, you know, he bought me a bike. And with that bicycle, I bought, I got me a paper route. I used to, uh, I used to uh, deliver papers. Uh, with, I had 120 customers. And uh, with those customers, they paid me $7.20 a week. Those customers, I, I, I got each one of those customers to subscribe to the Afro American. And each, each paper that I sold, I got three cents for a paper. And we're talking about 1945. So in 1945, I had an income. Thank you, Malika. The daily paper and the paper that I sold. Thank you, uh, you know, I can't say your mind. With that bicycle no, on wow, Saturday morning, wow. I went to the AMP. You need to give me a shorter night to call you. The letters created that time. That too and much to say. I delivered their boy. groceries to their homes because at that time, you know, people didn't have cars. And I had a gold set for $15. I was like, I made $15. And so I did but that. I the rest and then on Sunday morning, I went to Sunday school in the afternoon. And on Sunday morning, I went through the neighborhood and collected the shoes to shine them for church. And, uh, and, and, and so I would work up until enough time to go to Sunday school. And we had a we had a we had a relationship with the guy who owned the shoe shine parlor. That you know, like you shut the shine path for him and the path for you. You know, so you get paid. So and so I did that, and uh, I did that, and uh, right on up, really through high school. But also the other reason we I don't know they mentioned tobacco. Tobacco was was a source of income. Doing for kids doing that, but I didn't like working in green tobacco. I did not. It was too hard to work, and it was the hours were too long. So I did everything I possibly could to make sure I didn't have to go in that tobacco field. <laughs> and so next, and, and we lived in the, we lived in the housing project, and in the housing project, they would allow you to keep your lawn up because they furnished your lawnmowers, the push lawnmowers. So what I did, some of my customers. Of my paper customers who didn't have children, I'd ask them to let me use, let me do their lawns for them, you know. And I had a, I had a, I had a customers, you know, throughout the neighborhood. I would, I would check out a lawnmower from the office and keep it during the summer. <laughs> and uh, I'd just do early, early in the morning, I would get up and do those lawns. And then when the kids would come home in the afternoon. You know, from the tobacco field, I'm sitting up on the shady tree, you know, <laughs> drinking Donald Duck orange juice, frozen Donald Duck orange juice. Not only that, I don't have all that tobacco grip on me. But, uh, and then after that, uh, I, uh, when my uh, the foster parents passed, the first one died in April of, of, of 49. And then, uh, in fact, this is my neighbor. His mother, so they sort of took me under their arm because I was left with everything to do. And uh, when they, when, when she passed, welcome, uh, see boy, seventeen. I had to, uh, do everything, so to speak, when, 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 when my mother passed, and I went to. I, I had no intentions of going to college. I never thought I needed a college education to learn how to make a living because I had been working at a very early age. I don't regret having gone to college. I think probably might have enhanced it, the opportunity. Please don't get the lab and thank you for but joining. She wanted me to go to college, so I went to college to the honor of her. And uh, when I finished college, I, I went into the military. And I was 23 months, two weeks in a day in the military. And that was one of the most rewarding experiences that I've ever had because 
it, it gave me, it opened up a great many doors for me. And uh, that's, um, that's pretty much it. You on the airplane. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I guess I better start from the beginning. <laughs> I grew up in the Jerome Court, uh, right across from the Harold. And I, I learned an awful lot just growing up, uh, watching, because when I was five years old, uh, my mother and father divorced. Uh, there were five of us in the family. I had uh, a sister, a sister, and then three brothers on her own. I'm the baby. Uh, when my father left, he left home. He came to me, gave me 14 cents, and said, get this to the boys. I gave a nickel to my older brother. A nickel went to me. I then went to my middle brother, and the four cents went to me. Of course, I thought I was rich. Um, I learned to read at four years old. I used to sit in my mother's lap as she read the newspaper, and I would go, what's that word? What's that word? Uh, at two and three. And before you know it, I could read. So when it came time to <laughs> go to kindergarten, I went, but it only lasted one day. Second day, the teacher says, why are you bringing this boy here? He can read, plus he's called causing all kinds of trouble. <laughs> you know. So that was the end of my kindergarten career. I had to wait until the first grade, until the next year. Anyway, uh, growing up in Kenson was, it was a, really a delight because I, <clears throat> I began to observe others to kind of take the place of my father. When my father was there, he delivered furniture for Quentin Miller. And he had his truck, he'd bring the truck home, park it in front of Harold's house or in front of our house. And we'd be able to go on rides on weekends, et cetera. Um, but of course, that didn't last long. Um, my mother was a, basically a homemaker. What she did, she took in laundry. Uh, and when she couldn't make it by taking in laundry, she would do some seasonal work in tobacco factory. But she also had a side thing going. She made something called apple jacks and potato jacks, which were known throughout the area. <laughs> and so we made it, you know, we made it out pretty good. But my brothers had started going to the golf ground, as we called it then, caddying at the Keston Country Club. So, you know, you pass down the tradition, and at nine years old, that's what I did. I did it up to about 13. And I ran into a little problem. Um, the guy who beat Jack Nicholas in the National Juniors um, that year was the son of the pro at the Kentucky Country Club. And he made a mistake one day and called me boy. So I tapped him up on a fence. And I didn't caddy anymore after that. <laughs> so, um, we, uh, <clears throat> we, had a, we had a good life. Uh, I, during summer times, I frequently would travel to, to the north, to Camden, New Jersey, or to Brooklyn, because I had relatives or siblings living in those places. So I got to see another aspect of life in the United States. Other than North Carolina, which was really good. I also at that point became an athlete. I at in high school, I went out to the football team, made it, and my mother wouldn't let me play. <laughs> so uh, subsequently I went out to the basketball team and she didn't want me to play that either because in Little League I had hurt my knees. Um, well, the first time I hurt my knees, I was on 
on top of our, our gymnasium and somebody uh, watching the globe trotters play and somebody yelled police and I jumped 20 feet in the dark. <laughs> um, but so I was injured and she, did, but she really didn't want me to play. So anyway, uh, I wound up uh, being able to play uh, sports, at least basketball. Um, I learned to play tennis by watching people like John Dudley and Calvin Thompson. Uh, you know, they played too. Yeah. And, and just watching them is how I learned to play tennis. And one day I got a beat up racket, big hole in the middle. And I decided I'd get one of those uh, waterlogged balls and try to hit it. And of course, if you couldn't hit it in the middle, so that's how I learned to uh, uh, serve by turning the racket. That way, you're not going to hit, hit it in the middle. So, long story short, I subsequently did play basketball and tennis in college. Uh, but I learned from those experiences. I never took a lesson. Um, eventually, I did go to college at Fable State University, uh, where, again, I was going to play football. But uh, the athletic director was the basketball coach. And he said, no way. No, after the first day. So I didn't. But you can play a spring sport. So the spring sport became tennis instead of track. Um, again, that whole experience was, for me, I think somebody said before, I really didn't know I was poor. I was living in Mitchell and Courts. We had indoor plumbing there. Uh, I was able to travel in the summertime. Um, I was able to as they say, see different experiences. Um, and I was able to experience some uh, untoward uh, kinds of things as I grew and got around. Didn't understand it initially, but came to learn what they meant. Um, and uh, but we got through it. I've got a. Uh, John wants to say something. Yeah. God damn. <laughs> I wanted to ask a couple of follow-up questions, Mr. Dove, which will actually lead into some of the other follow-up, I think, for everybody. Um, you mentioned at the end there's some untoward things that happened, and you also talked about the incident at the country club and then the, the shout of police. And so I guess with the country club, I was wondering if you could you know, say what happened with that, whether you didn't go back because your family was concerned or because, you know, what kind of, so I guess I'm interested in what race relations actually looked like and how they worked there in Kingston for, right? Mr. Sykes? Uh, yeah, you know, that's, that's an interesting question you have because we, 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 we all did some things similar. We all, <laughs> we all catted at the country club. Yes. You, you all catted at the country club. And, you know, that, that, that experience, you know, it was almost like, you wanted to do anything you could to stay out of the tobacco field. And, it could, and catting, was, catting was one of the things that you did because you could do it every day. And incidentally, you know, there was one day that we were allowed to play. So it was Wednesday. It was, it, was, it, was on, it was on Wednesday, but there was a caddy house. And that was, that was, that was run by a, a, a fellow uh, uh, African American. And, and it, it was, you see so many things that take place. Who is you talking about? Ain't nobody having no protest. You know, it's like, I've been a golf fan for a long time, but I wasn't able to play golf, you know, because they were limited. I don't you know? know what you're and, talking you know, about. You take one club for everything, you know, because that, that was it. But you you had some you experiences. You hate crimes. Chatting, and you had some experiences based on the times that it was, you know, and what you yeah. did, so to speak. And uh, even catting was hard work. You know, for instance, you know, you had to catch it two rounds and you only got 65 cents. And then you, only, you, you had two ways you could make some money. You could either caddy or what they call now run down balls or look for lost balls. You made more money finding lost balls than you did for caddy because you could sell those balls. 
And then now uh, you. What's up, Landa Productions? How you doing so today? It was an experience that you really had to live it to 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 to, to relate to it. They were I guess, for lack of a better, you knew where your limits were at the country club, so to speak. And there was something that you didn't do, you didn't say, and you know, you just it was just a way of life, so to speak. That's where I'll take up because I did not accept some of those limits. And when uh, Larry Beck called me boy, that's his name. You can look it up. He beat Jack Nicholas in National Juniors in 1950. I'm doing good this evening. Uh, when he called me boy that day, <laughs> he shouldn't have done it because I went at him and we fought and I won and I left the country club and I just chose not to come back. I, I, I knew that if, if I did come back, it was because his father was a pro. Uh, that I probably wouldn't get any uh, bags. Uh, at nine years old, I started this, and I would carry two bags, 18 holes. Okay. Now I wasn't a little boy. I'm I'm always big, but I was hefty then because I, I was kind of a, a rock, you might say, at that point. I just grew taller later. And I don't know what protein that that poor child talking about. Want to say something about the um, the tobacco deal that everybody talks about <laughs> avoiding? I did work uh, with tobacco as, as a hand. Um, we would be picked up usually about. Oh, baby, it's something wrong with your mind. Ain't nobody protesting over him. Watch the um video and stop trying to rage war with the app. Okay, hey, nobody finna fight nobody. Yeah. Who are we but supposed to be protesting uh, again? We don't even know who you're talking about. In North Carolina, the tobacco leaves are taken from the stalk and put on a wagon and brought to the bar. Who is the tyrant that need to be thrown in jail? We don't know who that is. You just talking out your head right now. You're going to be watching the video. Not talking crazy. You know ain't nobody going to pay you no attention. Because we don't fight tyrants. You must be from another country. You can't be from America, honey. The government... All Ain't nobody been finna fight no war against the government. Be quiet. That was the term. You better stop talking about fighting the government to yourself or you end up in jail. The and handed them to the, uh, the guys that went in the barn. So dangerous. All up into the upper part of the barn to hang the tobacco so that it could be cured. So we don't do that. By the time we finished that, uh, it was time to go gummy and nasty and usually riding on the back of a truck back into the city and uh, that was usually what a day let me say those was, uh, the truck she's talking about was a truck was pulled by a mule and you yes. have to have a truck driver that and i was a truck driver <laughs> <laughs> I was awesome. <laughs> But you have to be very careful because if you mean to they talk, talking for y'all. No, they ain't because we believe in God. We ain't stirring all that. Don't no man scare the government of nobody else. Because of the government had their way, everybody be working for free, even you. Nah, your freedom ain't at stake. Don't believe that. And the thing about driving the truck, once you get back in the field, you, had to, you would have to wait until... Even the if they try to tell you up and put so you in a barn right somewhere now, and fight for yourself. I tell you, there's so many lies told. There's so many jokes told. Okay. <laughs> a lot of folk, a lot of folk lore. Real, you hear the guys, and that's the way the pastor, the singing and so forth. And okay, that's the way it. they use to sort of kill the time. We're going to block you in a minute. But... 
Uh, yes, I was part of the Golden Leaf Tobacco, and that was part of uh, the uh, product that was produced. Do you remember any of the songs? Well, Thank you, song? London. Please thumbs up the live. That's the song, but uh, the uh, Shine Shine. We won't get you a light This is a light This is a light mind. <laughs> Well, no, 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 I mean, this is a joke in terms of how far, you know, I can see, I, I remember one of the jokes, I can see as far as the Empire State Building, there's a fly on, on there, he's winked his eye at me, a different kind of, you know, it's kind of competing, and dozens, and just different kind of things that, uh, you know, make the day go by fast. My experience, well, I have two things I want to talk about. First of all, I worked with a Caucasian Jewish guy who married a white woman, and uh, he was ostracized from his family, a very prominent family in Keston, North Carolina, stadiums. I worked for each stadium. He went the lane. We, we ain't going to block him yet. We might time him out if he keep it up. We're going to time him out for 300 seconds. Um, he always so he better be quiet, he, she, so whatever it is. Would you consider going to a chef school and run a restaurant for me? We're going to ignore Not him for right much. now. But you keep talking about the and, world uh, order, we're going to block you for 300 but, seconds. Now be quiet. He used to travel also. Although he had his own store, he traveled around North Carolina selling clothes or samples for stores to pick out. Once we got out of the city limit, he would let me drive. I didn't have a license. <laughs> and uh, when we got to a certain place we had to stay overnight, <clears throat> he would also first have to find me a place to stay. And if I went to that city often enough, I knew where I could stay. And uh, so I was treated Thank you for well here. in terms of uh, Prejudice. But I do remember one experience that upset me. They had just established the bus in Keston. You stop in front of the project, but you wouldn't court. My mother and I got on, and I guess we sat about five seats from the back. There was a white guy who came on the bus. He stood right beside my mother. There were only about six people on the bus. He stood beside her. And he said, Nana, aren't you going to get up and let me sit down? There were seats up front. There were seats in the back. And the bus driver happened to hear it. I'm nine years old. <coughs> I didn't understand that. But uh, the bus driver said, look, man, we don't need this today. Come, take a seat wherever you can. There are plenty of seats up front. But I never got that. But uh, in terms of being treated fairly, I did pretty good because uh, a stadium I worked for three or four years, and uh, we got along well. So that was my major experience with uh, Caucasian individuals. I need to take off on that because I had a bus experience. Um, it was when I was, I think I was twelve. I had been to the country club, and that day I had money, I had made money, so I took the bus home. Well, the bus stopped at Queen Street, so it could change. And from Queen Street, it would go through Lincoln City and back to Edgewood Court. Well, I got a seat that was just right opposite the back door. And out there at Queen Street, and the, the, the next stop, which was just before it turned on to Lincoln Street, um, a white woman got on the bus and she had a bag. And somehow she made her way in front of me, even though I was on the inside, there was a, a, a white man sitting beside me. Um, she stood there and all of a sudden she asked for my seat. And she said, I'm white. And I replied and 
so it's toilet paper. <laughs> okay. And upon which time she called the bus driver who had made a stop. He came back, asked me to move to the rear of the bus. Well, by now we're in, in Lincoln City. So there were been any number of men who were in the back of the bus. And, and there were two or three who said, leave that boy alone. And he did. He went back and told the lady to come up and sit. In, in a, and there was a space right behind him that was tight, but to sit there. And he didn't say anything more uh, about it until we got uh, uh, through Lincoln City and, and I got off the bus in the Jewel Court. But the next year, and there was a lawsuit. A uh, lady in our community named Miss Hannibal, that was Dr. Uh, Hannibal's one, and uh, filed a lawsuit with against the ICC. Uh, because they issued the license for this bus company and challenged them. But within a year, that bus system did not exist. And today, you go back to Kenson, there is no bus system in Kenson. What was her um, she challenged the bus system? Because of uh, separate seating on the buses. Because I was going to ask you about that because you're describing a situation that sounds like it's integrated, even if it's. Uh, not easy. Yeah, the bus wasn't integrated. The bus, the bus really was not integrated. But no, so Mrs. Hannibal's, Mrs. Hannibal's, Mrs. Hannibal's, uh, husband was a doctor. And she was an activist. Yeah. And she was an activist, you know, even before, you know, and, and, and very, very active in civil rights. We're going to hear her name right now. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
subtle light. But um, <laughs> those experiences were unique and special, you know, for us. But I always liked to work. <laughs> what was your job at the drugstore? Waitress behind the counter. I waited on all the customers, you know, that came in and sat down. You know, they would place their order and we would take them to the table and what have you. And the uh, ones that couldn't sit down, they would have to go to the end of the counter. And we'd pack their lunch, our food up, and they'd take it out. So I think in some places that was a white job. Because <laughs> <laughs> she said it was not going to work. Oh, well, I remember the bus, and it didn't last long. I'm going to ask about the bus, but first I want to, Ms. Stewart, you mentioned about your work and, and the men talking. Um, I'm assuming that caddying was a job that the boys could do, but not the girls, is that right? That's right, that's right. That's right. So that you had, uh, so, that, so that part of what you all are describing is making choices within the options that's available. <laughs> and I was going to ask you, Mr. Jarman, you mentioned that the, the the culture, the folklore uh, in the fields uh, with the tobacco. And you said you did that work and you caddied. I know a few of you have. And I guess I was wondering if you could think about, uh, maybe I should ask about the bus first, but if you could think about sort of the pros and cons of working in the tobacco field with a larger group of African American versus, say, caddying, where you might be more isolated working, walking with a white person or something. Uh, let me make a reflection on it. First of all, that tobacco in the field, it was innovative. Okay. In the field, it was innovative. Oh. Simply because, I mean, the, the croppers, the croppers, the people that were working in the field. Yeah, Rosa you know, Parks you know, was a great person. Who, You're right. Back and, wrong with the black guys. and believe it or not, <clears throat> there was a degree of camaraderie in the field working that didn't exist once you got out of the field. You know, so. It wasn't, it weren't all blacks working in the, in the, in the back. It, it was okay. because most of the farmers, most of the time, it could be the farmer, might even be the farmer himself. But, but there was a relationship in that atmosphere that was a little different after you got out of the tobacco field, so to speak. But it, it, it had, even down to drinking out of the same water bottle, you know, because, because you know, it was okay, so bring you. They would ask the trucker to bring him some water. And they bring a, a mason job of water, and everybody would take a swing, you know, and, and, and that was it. I mean, uh, lunchtime uh, in the tobacco uh, field, usually, and, and a lot of times, a lot of places that I work, uh, the owner's wife would prepare the food. She would leave the uh, handing station maybe 30 minutes prior to lunch and she would prepare lunch for everybody and we would go to the house to eat <coughs> and we did eat at the table yes we did how many about how many people are we talking about working at a time on a farm well it depends well, well what happened there they had different farms and the the, the back uh, owners would come into town pick up the, the number of persons he needed for that day. And we'll take them. So there were about four or five different uh, farmers coming in. To certain locations. Or certain locations and uh, all of that. But about the food, that was pretty interesting because uh, that depended on how much you make. In other words, if, uh, if you carried your own lunch, that's one thing. He's, they would always say, Five dollars a day if I feed you, four dollars a day if you feed yourself. You remember that? Yeah, the, the, yeah, I remember that many times. Was that? Was it? Would that be the other way around? Did I hear that right? Would you make more money if you if, 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 if you took your own lunch? Yourself. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the primers or the croppers they referred to, they made more money than anybody else, and that was at ten hours was ten dollars, a dollar, a dollar an hour, a dollar an hour. Working in the field for 10 hours. And it's in the 40s. And yeah, this is, this is in the 40s. And then, you know, the people that are working at the barn, they're making $4 a day. And is it mostly men in the field? Men, men in the, the field. Yeah, women women the barn. Barn. And women at the barn. At the barn. And in the barn, Lupin, that's what they do? Well, that's the barn. That's in the too? Maybe with the. Well, could have been. Not at all. Not at all. Okay, so mostly not. 
you could occasionally, yeah, well, depending on what the situation is. The, 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 the farmer's wife, you know, she was usually at the barn because she'd leave there and go fix dinner. She'd leave at 11. She'd leave at 11 and have dinner and have lunch ready at 12. I mean, I mean, it's a spread just like the Ponderosa, <laughs> you know, and she'd leave at 5. And because you work from, from uh, 7 to 6, but she'd leave at uh, 11 and have lunch ready. She'd leave at 5 and have dinner ready. Because oftentimes, some of the uh, uh, croppers spent the whole week with the employer on the farm. Where would they stay? Where wherever, you know, you can stay at the back of the barn, you know, sleep under there, and you, and you, you, you cook corn under the hot ashes, you know, and all it was, this is a way of life. Well, for, you, you hadn't seen anything else different, so, you know, this is, this is where it's happening. With Cunningham, you had little shanties there. Yeah, 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 yeah. But there were times that women worked in the field. There was something called suckers. That there were flowers that grew on top. They had to be nipped. And I understand they had to be nipped, otherwise it would stunt the growth of the, of the plant. So they were nipped. And that juice would just get all over <laughs> But that's different from curing tobacco from that stage. It's at the earlier stage uh, in the growing of the, in the growing of the tobacco plant itself. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So that's earlier when it's growing, coming yeah. up to, to pinch the suckers off yeah. to make sure that it grows right. Yeah. yeah. And then curing after the harvest, part right. of the harvest system. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to add. Curing is, is is all the way through. Okay. On a given day, as she indicated, you would hang the tobacco up. The crop was in the field do that. And then you would have maybe a caretaker who would, uh, depending on what you use, would fight the uh, loops and flute. Yeah, yeah. And, and cure the tobacco. I just wanted to say at the end of the season, what was kind of rewarding was that they would have barbecue. And I don't know if Francis experienced that, but uh, that was one of the best part. You wanted to stay with that <laughs> that farmer because you knew that. And the barbecue was something special in Kenston, North Carolina. It's nothing like North Carolina barbecue. I don't know if you've had it. Big <laughs> 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 celebration. Uh -huh, but they would prepare the pigs and everything, and we would sit at the end and just have a good time. Don't the 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 oh yeah, but that, 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 you know, there's that, so much. In fact, they, they, they had a they had a, a, a radio station there, WFTC, World Foremost Tobacco Center. That's the that 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 World Foremost Tobacco Center, and it, it's just it's it's just so much. That's why I asked you, did you have the time? <laughs> because everybody here can get, tell you a story for pretty much all day, and going back hey. to the car. Hey, Sharita's kitchen. North Carolina State. Had a had a they had a group they called the Wolf Pack. She do. They used to come. They used to play. They lived in the in the I area. Think, but they, Eric, they took over. Thank you. Happy Sunday to you too way. as well. They could the Wolf Pack. I think everybody I know they didn't look guy, like who. Very prominent guy for the doctor. Doctor called him Johnny Fabo. Oh yes. John, Johnny Fabo was the truth. And, and and Doctor Hattie, they all came out and I remember them. I used to catch. I used I used to catch it for them. A guy named Slim and Mr. Boulder. I remember he, he had a he had a she had a me of a school teach. You know, but he was one of the cheapest golfers though that I ever <laughs> You know, you got sixty-five cents for, for two rounds of caddy, and he'd give you a dollar and want his thirty-five cent chain back, you know. And I never forget that. But 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 you know, those those are some those are some things that you just will never forget. You will never forget. You know. Anything that you could do to stay out of that tobacco field, <laughs> I did. And getting back to her, her father and the beaches. The beaches in Keston, it was a pretty prominent name. They used to sponsor a lot of talent that would come to town. I don't know. They had a lot of artists who used to come. They used to call it the Chitlin Circuit. The one nighters, you're like. James Brown, Amos Miracle, Charles Brown, Ruth Brown, Brown, yeah. Buddy Johnson, uh, Arthur Prysock, all those people. Larry Donnell. Larry Donnell. They would come to Keston. Keston was the hub. It was the hub. It was like, it was, it was right in the center between Camp Lejeune, Cherry Point, Fort, Camp, Fort, Bragg. Fort Bragg, and Seymour Johnson Air Force Field. So on, 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 on Friday night, 
Yeah. Everybody, it was referred to as K Town. Really, it was that during the war. It was referred to as K Town, and it was a very. It was. It actually had a red light district too. Mm -hmm. It had a red light district. Everything that you wanted, you could get if you knew where to get it. And I was, I was going to say that that's when I began my entrepreneur. <laughs> no, no. What happened was I was I was scaffolding before it became prominent up here. The scaffolding was good because the servicemen had to come to Kester and buy their tickets, but they had to get in line. So to speak, so it would cost two dollars to go to the dance. But you know, I used to buy a bunch of tickets and wait until uh, the servicemen would come because I would tell them, you know, like you can pay me two dollars and you don't have to stand in line and you got more time. But I was buying for a dollar fifty cents. Well, for $2. <laughs> oh, no question. Now, the interesting thing about Keston, being around those base and army bases, meant that we had to grow up real fast. Because we had sisters, and many times those sisters would come in and kind of fly to take over. But we had to defend the rights of our sisters. And that meant we had to uh, do some little things that we had to do. But we did what we had to do to defend our honor and our sisters. And that was every weekend. And they used to come to town and practice every weekend. <laughs> Going back to camp, you would hear of some major accident. I would say on a Monday basis, you would have these British soldiers being killed on that month. Having looked it up, going back to the base. What kind of incidents would you have with your sisters? Well, uh, they came in to date the girls. Many times they were our girlfriends. And many times we had to confront them. And if they didn't want to cooperate and leave the girlfriend alone, um, you had to uh, do it in the dark. <laughs> That's much more to say about that. <laughs> but I was going to add that my father did uh, run a club. It was a private club on North Street. And there was <clears> another <throat> club before his club called the Cotton Club. But on Friday night when those soldiers came in, you could not get down. That's just, I mean, they just came in and drove. Yeah, uh -huh. They would not only be in the club, my father had a window that he could look out because his customers, you know, they were screened. You know, he didn't let anybody come in. But um, they would just, if they couldn't get in the club, then they would stand in the street, you know, and they would just congregate. It was just an amazing kind of thing that they loved. But I guess it was like he, you said it was a hub. Yeah. Was and so they all came. It was sometimes called like the Little New York. Sugar Hill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess we have to remember the times. There probably weren't any other places That's that, true. that they could go uh -huh. because mostly the black soldiers, they they were just like us. We were black and we had our problems. Right. So they had their problems as far as places to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, was this mostly during the war or was it after the war as well? Let me ask one question that I hope is easy to help the transcriber out. Can somebody spell <coughs> it? Is it Mitchell Courts? Mitchell Mitchell M I T C H E L L. Mitchell Courts. Mitchell Courts. Mitchell Wooden Courts. So how do you spell Wooden? W O T E N. Okay. Okay. Mitchell Wooden Courts. Okay, and then I want to go back to the buses. You said, uh, you all said that they were segregated, but you mentioned that you were sitting next to a white man. I was a white sitting, man was sitting next to you. You were sitting next to me. Okay, so how, did, how does that work in the context of the segregated buses? Was it well, I was sitting person? first, and he came on. Right. As a matter of fact, he came on in front of a woman. Oh, I, I think, I think what you, there, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a white bus and a black bus, so to speak. It was a transit system yeah. that picked up throughout the community. And, and you know, blacks and, and whites were allowed to ride the bus, 
there were two separate bus lines. So I think her point is why we're just sitting on the same bus together. On the same seat. Yeah, same together. Same. Yeah. But the point is, whites have always had a privilege of the white want to do. Mm -hmm. They sit where they want to sit, but you couldn't do it last person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was it. Yes. And I recall one experience when I must have been about five or six years old. And uh, I you know, have these little strings on the bus, and I was pulling them and just playing with it. And the guy in the blonde here, the fellow said, Woman, shut that boy up. <laughs> I remember that today with the sarcasm, all those kind of things. And she said, Yes, sir, or something. But we were almost on Simon Bright, I also went on Bright Street, but there's Simon Bright apartments. That's what we have in that park. <coughs> Between the white and black community. There was an unwritten law, rule, that white folk sat up front. And uh, there was no, and black folk sat in the back. Now, if the bus began to get crowded, black folk would have to get out of their seat, the seats in the back and start moving back. As the bus got crowded, more white folk come in. Black folk had to move to the back because white folk normally didn't sit behind the black folk. The, the line of demarcation on the buses normally was the back door, <coughs> which was on the side. And where I was sitting at that time was right there on that seat. And when the white fellow sat beside me, he didn't ask me to get up. Okay woman came behind him and didn't ask him to get up. She asked me. And so is that the kind of, so I understand what you're saying about the prerogative. Mm -hmm. So um, is that something that there were, was it typical or occasional that whites might do something like that and sit down like that man did and not, not make an issue of it? And then in other times they would make an issue like the woman who did coming behind? Well, as a Somebody said it, it, it's the kind of thing if you, it was kind of understood where your place was. And, and most people will, would just acquiesce and move. Yeah. And, and that would be done on a regular basis. I just didn't that day. That's <laughs> false. Start talking about the drugstore. Actually, I got a question first, though. So, um, you said that uh, a number of African American men at the back of the bus said they should leave you alone. Yes. And that was when the bus was in the black community. Yes, it was in the black community. It was a rough part of the city. Yes. Yeah, so there was a sense that <laughs> yeah, he, knew, he knew he better kind of back off. So, there's this. There's this prerogative, and there's this understanding, and yes. there's this place, but then there's also this space to say, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. How did you feel when they did that? Oh, I felt that I was taking a chance, number one, doing what I did, but when I heard these voices in the back, I said, oh boy, I, I was gratified to hear it, but I, I didn't expect it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. stand it was it? Number two. Okay, wait. Well, okay. uh, number two. I work there. This was two weeks after Greensboro, the sit ins, February of 1960. I was a uh, senior in high school and I had cooked up a uh, kind of a scheme to integrate <clears throat> standard drug number two uh, with a couple of friends, uh, brothers. Curtis Henderson and Tom Henderson. Uh, I asked Curtis to dress as an African diplomat. <laughs> and he did. His brother was going to be a lookout. We were going to standard drug number two to get him served. I was going to be his interpreter. I knew that Ghana had just gotten uh, its freedom uh, the month before. And when we went into Standard Drug, he sat at the counter and I told him all he needed to say was on Gawa and some derivative thereof. And, and he would say that to me. He wouldn't say it to anyone else. And I would interpret for him. And I was going to interpret in French. So I let the uh, waitress know what he wanted to eat. 
and that he was a diplomat from, from Washington. He had the appropriate dress on and so forth. She didn't know what to do, but she wrote the order down. The way to... No, wait, no. Does she understand French? No, no. I, I talked to her in English. Okay. But so where does the French come in? That was what I was talking, saying to the diplomat. Okay. Okay. He wasn't replying to me in French. He was only Sorry. using what he heard on Tarzan. <laughs> okay. Umgawa, blah, blah, blah. Well, anyway, she got confused and decided to call a manager over. It was a young white fellow. And I explained to him the same thing I'd explained to her. And he looked really confused, but I was resolute. And he asked for the order in. I had convinced him that this was an African diplomat and he didn't want to have a diplomatic uh, problem here. So the order goes in, and a friend of mine who lived in my building in the projects started her name. <laughs> She, she started to bring the order out. I, 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 we had ordered toast, coffee, and eggs. And she, she saw us standing there. And she, she turned around real quick and handed the, the order to the original white uh, waitress and said, you here, you take it. And then she turned and went back in the kitchen. <laughs> so, so, so she brought it in. And sure enough, and Need it because you took it. was served, and we stood there serious, and, we were, and, and we were not dying in, inside, but I'm being resolute. And, and he was eating, and, and Tom was looking, and uh, uh, the major no police came. And sure enough, we were able to get through the meal, get and we were able to pay for it. And Good as we were leaving, least, God, Olive, Olive came out and saw us leaving. <laughs> You can see nothing but tea. <laughs> we got outside and we ran back to East Keston the fastest, the fastest that you could ever we, we must have broken the 100 yard dash that day. <laughs> True story. Yes. <laughs> and when I was working at Stanley College, I worked together, so I knew exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought she was going to drop the dish when oh, she saw us. Yeah. <laughs> I never sat. I stood all the time and, and did the interpreting, and so, I didn't eat. So, so they didn't recognize you. They didn't know you from around town. No. So it wasn't a place that you, you went on a regular basis. I, I had been there, but they didn't know who I was. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> 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 now, we took joy in doing things like that because uh, we knew we couldn't do it, you know, real. So uh, I remember once my sister, uh, we went to the drugstore. I can't remember if it was number one or number two, but they, the, the store, the place was filled with white people. And so we had to wait and wait and wait. And she had put in a prescription. And um, it took them so long. I know it must have been at least 25, 30 minutes. She said, and they bring it, and I just drop it. So then they finally brought the prescription and handed it to her. Um, she didn't pay them, but she just dropped it. And somehow that just gave us so much satisfaction because they had made us wait so long. So we just took pride in doing little things like that that we knew we could get away with. And so when we dropped it, of course, we didn't. One other thing on that point. Uh, my sister, the the one that's uh, next to me, used to go into the department stores that had black water, white water. She used to take the light and go in to see what white water tasted like. It was colored. Co colored, yeah. Colored. colored, white and colored. Um, and so she would go in and taste it. And that became kind of a, a thing to do. Uh, because later on, my sister in law used to do it as well. But, so I think we've all done that. Yeah. yeah but, I didn't try that. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, it was the kind of thing. Uh, it was, yeah. 
you know, you're faced with situations and you're saying, you know, well, I'm going to get away with Have those water yeah. down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Were they equivalent in Kingston? Or were they obviously equivalent. right now? Because some of them had the cooler, some of them, the white ones had the cooler, and the black one didn't. It, it depended on the store. Still, okay. Now, another song way of uh, get back. I was an avid uh, baseball fan as a child. I won a glove that could put my name. And I went to get my glove. The question was whether they were going to award it to me at the ballpark. But they uh, did the right thing and gave my glove. But there was a, the Kingston uh, Indians. Uh, was a team she goes to this this today and uh right beside the uh stadium there was a railroad track and there were some supplies in there but by the beer and we could get in the the, the car i don't know jackie were you ever fun <laughs> <laughs> you know about it. Okay. Well, anyway, my brother and I, we were pretty good guys. But we, we had some of that beer also. We would uh, take the beer, maybe three bubbles if they hit the, the big size, put it in the, in the screen behind the Mitchell Court and, and cool it. We had a good time with the beer about three months until they found out what was going on and they took some of the guys to court. But they did, did not implicate my brother and I. I know I had at least two quarts of beer. But uh, they didn't implicate us because we were supposed to be pretty good guys. So they got the guys in court said, how many beers do you drink? He said, one. How many? Two. How many? Three, maybe. And that went on and on and on and on. But uh, that was a, just some way of uh, getting back. So I'm just getting back. Most of your interactions with whites either through work or in public places like the drugstore? Well, I indicated that I lived on Reed Street, which was at the edge of Lincoln City. It is either going oh, yeah, or down, but next to me was a apartment complex called Sam Bright, mostly poor whites. Right. And they were not much any better than we were in terms of. Uh, okay, and friend. And, but Thank you for joining. Get you some good night sleep in England, and thank you for watching. And we go out and swim, and then come back. But that was my that experience. Except that, like Jackie, I shine, I shine shoes as well, and I wouldn't have to go through the apartments. I couldn't. They were not uh, well enough, well to do enough in the in the uh, apartments. To have the shoes shine, so I had to walk through the apartments to the better class of white, not the better class, the common class. And uh, I shine the shoes and all we walk all the way to the bus station and we shine the shoes and come back. And that is what I did on Sunday morning. And so I had my money that I, I was making that time all the week. Uh, so uh, that was my experience. My experience was sort of negative. Because uh, I also love to go to the movie, and in order to get to the movie, I had to walk down Main Street, by the, pass by the white theater to get to the black theater. And invariably, these white kids knew we were coming. And that was a tough time. They threw rocks. Every Saturday, they'd be in waiting for us. They threw rocks. That was a very uh, powerful experience because uh, we just had to do a lot of writing. A lot of writing. The girls didn't have that experience, probably. Well, I we did. did. You did? I, I'm not going to the movie, but I used to ride my bicycle to my aunt's house. I lived on Shine Street, which was, I guess, Lower Kenston. And my uh, aunt lived on Macon Street, <clears throat> which was a little distance. And I had to go. We used to ride the bicycle through the meal, which was so dangerous. It was a wood meal, I believe. And um, right there, after I got immediately, after I would leave the uh, 
meal, I went into what we used to call, uh, it was a very uh, bad uh, white section. And one day uh, I was cornered by these white boys and they took my bike and knocked me off my bicycle and spit on me. And uh, uh, I got up and went, finally got to my aunt's house. But uh, uh, I did that. That happened to me once, but it was a frightening time to go through that area again. You know, but it, it, it happened to us too. Yeah. No, they gave me the bike. They just they, wanted they, they me. just harassed me. Yeah, just harassed me. Just harassed me. Yeah. yeah. So maybe we could talk about the uh, school walkout. I think we can probably keep on with these stories for a long time. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Don't you? Yeah. You're just skin the surface. Yeah. 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 I, I think we all know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but can somebody start us off with maybe where the idea, what do you remember about where the idea for the lockout came from? It had happened in our class, the class of 1952. Okay. We were a class of individuals oh my probably started from uh, kindergarten to 12th grade. 80% of us were together throughout our school experience. So through that process, there was a lot of trust, a lot of helping each other, get to school, that was from first, third, grade, all the way to 12th grade. Now, so that kind of tells you about interaction and the love we had for each other. Okay. Out of that, we used to have a civics class on Wednesday. We talked about different things in the community, uh, responsibility in uh, the real world. But this particular day, B.C. Davis, Hussey now, B.C. Davis, she was our teacher. She was a very motivational teacher, and a very serious teacher. And that day we were doing our weekly reader, and the topic for that day was for an ideal school has, what an ideal school has. So we saw all those, all those items a good school has. We asked Ms. Davis, is there a school in our area that has these things? She said, yes, the school up on the hill, the white school, Granger High School. So being civic-minded, and a class that was very serious, and we were considered the elite school class in the school. We had A and B. A was college preparatory class, and the B mainly was the person who went into a trade or whatever. So we're sitting there looking at each other. So we said to uh, Ms. Davis, just spontaneously, to leave the room. And she didn't relent. She said, okay, I'll leave. So we began to discuss how we can go about getting some of the things we needed. So we came up with eight items. And when we let, had her to leave the room, because we want to discuss this, and that was a good thing. Because we didn't want her to get involved in any of this process as the teacher having started something. And here we had some pretty, pretty kids. She must have had an idea. She had an idea, maybe. No, she didn't have an idea. Because when I, I'll tell you something that happened later. And what you'll read is that she didn't know what the heck was going on. She really didn't know what the heck was going on. But anyway, we began to discuss. 
Can I just interject? Um, what I'm what I'm curious about is the idea of a teacher walking out and leaving students. So I guess she must have trusted you at least at some level. The class yes. itself. She knew we were very responsible kids. And Jackie and Francis and they'll tell you our class was kind of special. And they trusted us, and you will find the trust later on. Uh, so we began to discuss things that we wanted to do. First thing we said, hey, let's put down the items or the things that we need, and find out when the school board meet and petition the school board to get these things out of school. Okay, so uh, we called the school board. We found out the school board meet on Monday. We asked them who would like to uh, come in and meet with the group at night. Gentlemen, the same woman that was three, they employed they had that Monday, we decided alternative plans in case we didn't respond appropriately. Uh, and uh, we, we, we decided to meet with the students. We brought the other class in, of 12th grade, because we wanted them to be a part, and some juniors. And we, we made them a part of the discussion after we had gotten pretty much what we wanted to do. Basically, we met. Stuart, the president allowed us to meet in the auditorium first without any teachers around. Because here again, he knew the class and that we were considered responsible kids. Damn, all y'all. No, no, during class time, the first meeting. Now, the next meeting was met in the old barn. We're strategizing and organizing. He said, now, if the board didn't give the proper response, we're going to walk out. I'm going to witness everybody. We had decided what the proper response would be. So, that week, came to Monday, we strategized. I mean, had everybody on board, 720 students. We told them not to tell your parents or your teachers. What's going on? And do you believe to this day, 2013, nobody's ever told me that an adult knew what was going on? Kids. About 25, 30. Okay. So, we had all the plans set. The sign was yeah, Carolyn Stewart has lost a red pocketbook. Carolyn Copeland has lost a red pocketbook. If anybody finds it, please bring it to the office. So, we met with the board that Monday. Around about 7 o'clock. They call us in about 7 30, maybe 8. You know, so, okay, you kids can come in. There were seven of us, but uh, the committee here, uh, we were the committee of five. Yeah. In, we had our thing all typed out. We gave it to the uh, board. He looked at it. He passed it next for the five, five board members. He passed it around. They said we use school support. And we left the room. Every about eight, ten minutes, the call us in. They said, Who sent you? That was the first thing they asked, Who sent you? I said, Nobody sent us. You can tell us who sent you. Nobody sent us. So they said, Look, what you kids are asking for. It's not in the budget for the next 10 years. We looked at each other, we walked out. We said, Thank you very much. We left. That was on Monday. That Tuesday, the announcement was made. Now, there's some a little confusion.
just about that. Because I get announcements every every morning, about five, six minutes. What's going to happen right, today? Richard Thompson and myself. And uh, I really made the announcement. We made it together. The secretary always wanted to say that she made the announcement. So you may come into that. But I made the announcement. Even if I didn't make it, I told her what to say because that was <laughs> the line for everybody to get others. And do you believe? When I made the announcement, 720 students got up out of their seats, orderly, went to pick up the placards that we'd already made up in case the board didn't respond properly. And we've watching down Street. Watching down Street. No incidents. People were curious what was going on. Teachers were running around. What's going on? What's going on? And uh, we gone. These kids trusted us tremendously. And I've cried it many times since I thought about it. What could have happened? Because these two members of the school board came to our school to get those five kids together who were us. Well, Bring them in. Brought us in. We are in school, however, but we still around the school strategizing because we had to have a plan as to when the kids were coming back and all of that. This is a Monday. So they told us that look, you know, you're seniors. You know benefit from what, what you're asking. I said, there is a benefit. Because we have brothers and sisters. The all age education is very important. They said, but if any of those kids, 720 kids, get into any problems in the community while they're out of school, you guys are not going to graduate. Well, says so be it. So take our tennis. So that happened. We didn't go back to school until the next Monday of Thanksgiving. And we rolled back, we gave the announcement to the kids. We had key people to call, key numbers. And that got everybody back. 722 came back that Monday after Thanksgiving. Same way they walked out. And that was pretty much it. But uh, there was some, some situations. It was the coolest day of the year. And Jackie lived on the front row. See, we all congregated a theater across the street from the projects. They knew exactly where to come. We marched down the street. We dispersed there. It was a cold day. And Jackie uh, had a, quite a few of the kids come to his house. <laughs> yeah, we went to the theater. Call theater. And uh, Jackie got in trouble for that. But at any rate, that's pretty much what happened. But during that time, Dr. Hannibal, oh, his wife, oh, Alice, Alice, they were my next door neighbor. Being independent, because the husband didn't have to uh, cater to anybody. And that's why we had our parents, we didn't want our parents to know, or our teachers, what was going on, because we didn't want anybody to lose his job. We had all that figured out at 17, 18 years of age. I have a number of follow-up questions, but before I ask those, I was wondering if some of the rest of you could say when you heard about it or how you found out or what your reactions were, whether you knew before the announcement. Well, I think that our the president of our class was a, was a part of the committee. So he was feeding the information afterwards. <coughs> what did you think when you heard about it? You know, I really didn't think too much of it. I thought it was a great thing to do. I was afraid, very, very much afraid, because I was wondering, when I get home, what in the world am I going to say to my parents, you know? But I went along with the crowd. What did you say to your parents? Well, they asked me, 
and they're very, very kind about it and loving about it. Uh, they asked what we had done and if we had thought about it. I told her, yes. And there were no punishments for that or anything. So I felt good about that. Well, what I guess our parents must have thought they knew that we had second class everything. The books, anything we got was passed on from the white kids to us. And sometimes they were torn pages, and, you know. So I guess underlying when our parents found out about it, they didn't have a problem with it. They just couldn't say anything or uh, be a part of it, you know. And since 720 of us had walked out, the school board. So I think you know, the has been as touch that. Do anything to us because we were kids, but they couldn't no. do something to our parents and community. So they didn't say anything. Our parents never said anything about it. So, um, you know, the thing was to get us back in school because they didn't know if we had a plan D or a plan C. So uh, they were anxious to get us back because that was a way that they thought they could keep us under control. And even my. Uh, so I mean, you took them a look at the kids. Now, uh, he walked out too. His father was that one person, night too. And he didn't even tell his father, you know. So it was a thing that we kept our mouths shut. In many cases, we were afraid, you know. But we felt like if everybody else was going to do it. And then when we met with uh, the leaders, uh, the teachers were around anyway. And they told us to meet. Yeah, they allowed us to meet. They weren't. They, and so um, they told us what to do. And we just followed along. And, and during that procession, as we were going what down, that house, there was no talking. We just rose up, you know, just like a, I don't know, I don't know how. It was just a strange kind of feel. We just rose up when that announcement was made. I was on the top floor. I don't know where you were. And we just walked quietly on out. Picked up whatever we were supposed to pick up. Pick up and went on down the main street or wherever those, uh, they told us to go. It was just an amazing kind of thing that happened. And you just did. Well, I think the kids did a good job of hiding them. My hand. Uh, we didn't have them to bring up any particular place. We told them, "Be careful how you do it." And uh, they did it. However, because I don't recall us saying bring all the placards to a place, we didn't do that. But when when we uh walked out, wherever they got them, they had them, and we were going down the main street. Nobody said anything. I said a plaque. Plaque uh, quality education and things like that. My understanding, of course, is now it's much later now that the blackers were all off campus. Oh, no, we didn't know the school. They did them off campus. Yeah. Uh, maybe at the theater or somewhere around the school. I think that the, most of them ended up at the college theater.
separation. Yeah, they were well schooled. Now, I believe know. it or not, he the Bible was like, no. We never even uh, felt so I the same thing. anything, but let's do this. It was needed. And even to this oh, day, we didn't even talk about it. We had never met as a group to discuss what we had done. And yeah, even to 2010, it did not strike me as the significance of what happened. Oh, that's 2010, when we did a reenactment of the situation. Oh, because it wasn't oh. for publicity. Uh, I will, uh, we want to raise the awareness of it. And the beauty of it all, as you'll probably read later, that that 10 years turned into 18 months. We're not dying, really. Everything we had petitioned, eight items, you read about those, were built in 18 months. We had all gone to college. We came back. It was in the deep freeze also though. That's when we saw what had happened. There should be enough five minutes. Assurances because a little bit I've read from the newspaper, which I understand is one kind of says that the school board like etc. Um so how is what is your recollection and how it made? Well the season was made because uh we knew that we we had done what we had it to do. Anybody, anybody seen the red? We could stay out for 10 years. <laughs> that's, that's a fact. So, the five of us got together in the, the committee and said, let's get on back in. And that we can make decisions that we would uh, all keep people that we had already designated all key numbers and everybody got the message we had it pretty well coordinated i, I, I was um, i'm gonna get amazed did you do that because you felt like you maybe more yeah. exactly did you have a sense that you know, your was in 18 months or no. a certain time period we just didn't know we just didn't know we made the point we don't know as much as we can. Now there were some some uh, reaction. Dr. Hannibal, Alice Hannibal, she wrote point. some letters to the school board Who and the paper expressing specific feelings. Now she got some threats. She got some threats. Uh, the to our boy house or burn it down. So there were six seniors who spent a week at her house. And uh, I don't like to talk about we were ready. That's what you would say about that. We stay yes, to her. She would say the three of us stayed for a week. I stayed three nights. I remember the one from her house to school. They got some chances. I was looking at those shoes. No, the chapter on the shoes right now. See, because they didn't say anything. They didn't do it. Yeah, it, it, it came back to the business, and they, you know, they didn't know what we were gonna do, you know. So, and and, and you know, they didn't talk about it. It wasn't talked about. <laughs> Reverse twenty. Okay, I look. <laughs> <laughs> they look scary people. I don't know. I think I look like crazy. I don't know why I would be on that Dolly more. He tried to get out of the he did ask her what she knew about that activity. And of course, she, all she could tell him was, I don't know anything. Uh, which is to say that if she did know something and had told him, uh, given him some kind of uh, inference, 
Then he would have used that as an economic <laughs> Every time I see that feeling, it's first. 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 Every time I see it's like my lower body is fine. So I can tell you. But then it's like, oh, the top of the day. She's going to run around, trying to find out what's going on, what's going on. This is what my lower body is Leave those kids alone. Oh, yeah. And she just doesn't have an iPhone. And even when the school board came out, the next day, the Wednesday, he was very calm. Quiet. He admitted that he didn't know the situation, but it happened. And he didn't show any emotion. As I remember, he was in the room. It was cool. It was a good man. He was just a good man. And I guess deep down within, he understood. So it sounds like at least a number of your teachers and your principal were probably supportive of you, uh, even though they were limited in their ability to express it. That is very true. That's a good way to put it. Because even to the point they allowed us to meet on two or three occasions without any mm -hmm. teacher or adults being around. That's amazing. It's very significant. I'm playing there with your makeup and all that. I've been trying to get to my eyes. I can feel my eyes. I can feel my eyes. Oh, yeah. 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 O
Good night, everybody. I'm going to end my live now. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And come again for another awesome video.